church. And we had stopped attending our longtime church for quite a while at that point, and had ended up then eventually settling down in another church in town. And we felt very welcomed there, um, but it just never quite felt like the right fit or the right time for us to dedicate her. So some of the pieces were in place, but most of them were still missing. Um, and as time passed, the pieces just didn't fall into place like we had hoped that they would, leading us once again to become churchless. And at this point, Molly was already two and a half years old, and the thought of dedicating her had been pushed pretty far to the back of our minds at this point. Um, after all, you dedicate babies, you don't necessarily dedicate kids, right? So um, even though she was older, the thought was still there, and it was still really important to us that we dedicated her, but it had to be the right thing. And almost four years before, The first day that we came here, we had felt so loved and embraced and cared for by this church and the families here. It finally feels right, and we know and trust that God has brought us to this church family and that we are here for a reason. And we are finally home. very difficult. Personally, if it wasn't for my faith in God, I don't think I could have done it. Even though I wrestled with him and was so angry and confused and frustrated at times, I did always have a firm belief that he had a plan for my life and that it would be good. And even though I did believe that at my core, it was still very hard day to day. After a few years, I started praying, if I'm not meant to be a mother, please take away this on in my heart. But he never did. After about five years of trying to start a family, God presented the idea of adoption to me. An older couple in our church had adopted three young brothers, and I looked at them and thought, if we were good people, we would do that too. And truthfully, I kind of resented the idea. Why did we have to adopt? Uh, John wasn't really in favor either, and so we just kind of left it. But God kept it in my mind and in my heart, and I started researching. We learned that there was an agency in Winnipeg called Adoption Options, and we were very impressed with the work they did and what they stood for. We decided to learn more, and over the course of the next year, we created an adoption file and put our names in the box, as they call it, to be prospective parents for a domestic adoption in Manitoba. We were told that it would take about a year and a half to two years on average. At first, it was nice to just do the work and hand it over. It was out of our hands, and we didn't have to do anything. But over time, that had its challenges, too. 
Being told our file was shown to the birth mother but not picked happened a few times a year and it became more and more devastating. We thought we were following God's lead, but now what? After another six years of waiting for an adoption, we decided that it was obviously not meant to be. We must have misread the signs again. So on June 16, 2021, our adoption file expired and we chose not to renew it. We would no longer be shown to prospective birth parents, and it was hard to get to this point, but we feel it was the final act of surrender to God, trusting that he would take care of us and that life could still be meaningful. Two weeks later, on July 2nd, I got a call from the kids. I was at the lake and I was at work. I could tell instantly something was up. I immediately thought something was wrong, so I was shocked, and she said, we got hit. Got to remove our file. We are shown to a birth mom that she was pregnant. I was speechless, so all I could do was laugh. All we knew that a baby was due in three weeks. <clears throat> Five days after the initial call, we met the birth mom. We walked up to us again. Because we were total strangers, yet discussing the most intimate details of our lives, her life, and the life of this child, we were hoping that she would like us. Were, she thought we were from a letter and a few pictures. All while discussing names, a birth plan, and an open agreement that we had honored for 18 years. The next few days were filled with planning, shopping, cleaning, and organizing. And then on July 14th, a mere day before, <laughs> 12 days after we got the call. The next two days were a roller coaster of emotions. We were already falling in love with the little girl. We had just one picture to stare at. Oh man. <laughs> oh, I can't even see it. <laughs> oh, that's a shock. <laughs> I'll take over. Oh boy. Okay. Um, yes, we had one little picture to stare at um, for 48 hours. Um, but we knew that. Um, birth mother could change, would, may not sign consent at 48 hours, and then she had another 21 days to change, change her mind and have a are back with her at any point. So we knew that we had to give all our whole hearts to this baby from the start and trust that God would carry us through. So on July 16th, we went to the women's hospital to meet Amira for the first time. It's hard to explain the intensity of this moment to you. Um, we walked into the room. And there she was lying in a little crib, and it was the happiest day of our lives, and all our dreams were finally coming true. And yet on the other side of the bed, it's her birth mother with um, tears streaming down her face. Um, love and grief and sacrifice, all tangible and real. Everyone loved that baby very much. Um, and then in a matter of a few intense minutes, pictures and hugs and tears, we were alone with our baby for the first time. The next three weeks did fly by, and yet they seemed to last forever, and on the 21st day, we stayed up until midnight lying in bed with a sleeping Amira, just counting down the minutes. And the next day, we shared our joy with the world, and we were so overwhelmed with all the love and support we received. There were a lot of people praying for this baby over the years. Um, some loving grandparents who never got to see their prayers come to fruition, but Know that they know, and also many of you that were here that are here today have faithfully prayed for us. Um, it's 14 months later, and here we are. We are honored to have been chosen to be a mirror's mom and dad. She will always be a reminder of God's faithfulness to us, and we want to dedicate her today and raise her to know that God loves her and He was working in her life long before she was even born. So, friends, today we rejoice with both Missy and Ryan and Katie and John in the gift of these children. And we come together to give thanks to God, the giver of life and the source of all blessing. Jesus invited children to come to him. 
So we bring Molly and Amira to our Savior, praying for his blessing as a sign of the kingdom of God. Friends, you have offered Amira and Molly to the strong and tender providence of God and to the nurture of the church. And we also, as members of this congregation, promise, and, and your church family, which can be larger, larger than your congregation, <laughs> Um, we promise to share in your child's nurture and to support your efforts in raising them to know the love of God and the gift of our salvation through Jesus Christ. Our prayers will be with you and for you, that this task may be both joyful and fruitful. Let's hear the gospel concerning Jesus and children. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and don't hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who won't receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and he put his hands on them and blessed them. I invite you to stand uh, with us for this next little bit. I'm going to address uh, both Katie and um, John and Missy and Ryan, um, just asking them to give sort of this verbal um, verbal commitment uh, before us as their witnesses. So all of you together, Katie and John and Missy and Ryan, will you as parents, by God's help, dedicate yourselves to the Christian nurture of your child? to bring her up in the worship and the teaching of the church, that she may come to know Christ as Savior, be baptized and follow him as Lord. If you will, say we will. Friends, will you as members of God's church, perhaps members of this congregation, but the larger church as well, will you dedicate yourselves to be fruit faithful in your calling as members of the body of Christ, so that these children and all of other children among us may grow up in the knowledge and love of Christ our Savior. If you will, say, we will. Amen. All right, girls. Let's start with Ma. Well, we're kind of doing this over here. Whatever. Okay. So I'm just going to come over here. And I'll say a blessing over each, each girl separately. Molly, because Jesus said, let the children come to me, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. We present you to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our Lord Jesus Christ be with you to defend you, within you to keep you, before you to lead you, beside you to guard you, and above you to bless you. Amen. Amira, because Jesus said, let the children come to me, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. <laughs> we present you to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our Lord Jesus Christ be with you to defend you, within you to keep you, before you to lead you, beside you to guard you, and above you to bless you. Let's pray together. Gracious God, giver of all life, may your blessing be and remain upon these children. Keep them in, always in your love, that they may grow wise and whole. Bring them safely through the dangers of childhood and the temptations of youth. Lead them to personal faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, and to be Christ's faithful disciples throughout their lives. We pray for these parents to know you in such a way that they may love with your love, teach with your truth, and be signs of your kingdom for their ch children. Amen. See what great love the Father had lavished on us, that we might be called children of God. Take a seat. Actually, we're going to sing again, so stay standing. Melissa and Rachel will lead us in one more song. Are we going to do Jesus Loves Me? Oh, we're going to sing Jesus Loves Me as they come up. Ready? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes. Jesus loves me. 
ladies. You can take your seat and let's pray. Lord God, it is a gift uh, to know that we are your children. We ask that you will remind us of that as we go through our day and our week, that we are beloved children of yours. Jesus, we thank you for becoming one of us, for taking on humanity um, in order to save us, in order to reveal the Father to us. We thank you for how you taught us uh, by your actions and by your words. And may we learn from you this morning. We ask you once again, Lord, to teach us to pray. Amen. All right, my young friends, you are welcome to go to Sunday school out those back doors. Um, there's some people racing, actually. Um, and Piper will be your teacher today. So it is such a privilege to hand on our faith to our children, isn't it? Uh, and a responsibility. We teach them what it is to value it, um, this faith, and to practice it by doing it and by talking about it. Uh, we connect the dots for them. Thankfully, <laughs> And I say this with so much gratitude. We are doing this together as the church. Um, the village plays an important role in this. And we do it as faithfully as we can, right? We're human. Uh, we don't get it right all the time. Um, but I do think that being open to learning and growing ourselves as disciples of Jesus is part of passing on this faith to our kids um, and our grandkids. And that's what this sermon series is about. Uh, we are asking Jesus to teach us to pray, recognizing that we have things to learn in this. I've been thinking a lot about this lately, that our assumptions about prayer, like what prayer is and what it's for and what it does or should do, often determines what and if and how we pray. I'm going to say that again. Our assumptions about prayer determine what and how and if we pray. The same goes for our assumptions about the one that we are praying to. Our theology, uh, what we think, what we believe about God, often determines what and if and how we pray. So today I invite you to take the posture of a learner with me. To set your assumptions aside um, about prayer or about God, maybe, uh, and be open to seeing prayer through a different lens. We're going to take a little journey through the Gospel of Luke this morning, and we're going to look at what Jesus showed and taught about prayer throughout the Gospel. We got a glimpse of it last week, um, and we'll see more today. And I hope that we're going to come out on the other side with some clarity and some wisdom and maybe even a deeper faith. So to start, I invite you to picture yourself standing in front of a large painting at an art gallery or a museum, maybe. It's something I've always wanted to do, actually. In my mind, I am totally like a city girl that goes to art galleries like once a month or something. If that's not me, I, I would like to uh, incorporate that into my life someday. So the painting before you depicts a number of scenes that all carry the same theme. Somehow they're all tied together and they're all telling the same story, but again, like there's these different scenes. Uh, you could also picture yourself at a cathedral because that's what a cathedral is. Um, there's scenes throughout all the whole cathedral and they're all woven together somehow. They're all telling a story, it's all art. Um, even the architecture plays into that. But anyway, you can choose. You can be at a cathedral. You can be in front of this painting. Um, I, we're going to look at each scene 
together. And then we're going to step back at the end and look at the whole thing. Uh, so this is what I'm inviting you to do as we stand before Luke's depiction of Jesus as he prays and as he teaches his disciples about prayer and tells them what to pray for. There are so many instances of these in Luke. Um, it's spread throughout the gospel, and together they paint a picture for us. Uh, they tell a story, and there's something there, I think, if we have eyes to see. So like we did last week, friends, um, I'm going to invite you to hear an invitation from Jesus and to respond to it out loud. So we did this last week. We'll, we'll do it again. The response is coming from Psalm 119, verse 16. And it says this, um, so just listen, and then we're going to say it together one time before I um, read the invitation. You are good, and you do good. Teach us your statutes. This is our prayer. You are good, and you do good. Teach us your statutes. Statutes are like your ways, your law, like it's all kind of encompassed in that. So here's this, uh, let's, let's say it one time together. You are good, and you do good. Teach us your statutes. Now hear this invitation. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's respond to Jesus together. You are good and you do good. Teach us your statutes. Because we'll be journeying through the book of Luke, I'm not going to ask you to follow along in your Bibles much today. Um, we're going to eventually land in Luke 22. Um, that'll be a place where you can turn and read along with me if you'd like. Um, I'm going to read a verse here and a verse there, maybe give you a little bit of background, and then I'm going to make some observations. And we'll do that a couple of times, and then eventually we'll tie it all together. So here we go. In Luke 3, we get the story of Jesus' baptism. It says, Now when all the people were baptized, and Jesus had been baptized, he was praying. And the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him, in bodily form as a dove, and a voice came out of heaven. You are my beloved son, and with you I'm well pleased. In Luke 9, we get the story of his transfiguration. One day, he takes Peter, and John, and James, and he goes up on a mountain to pray. And as he's praying, the appearance of his face changes, and his clothes become dazzling white. In that moment, both Moses and Elijah show up and talk with him about his departure, his exodus, and his disciples witness this. And suddenly, a voice comes out of a cloud, and this is similar to his baptism, right? Comes out of a cloud, and it says, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. What do we see about uh, prayer? What do we learn about prayer in these two stories? Somehow, as Jesus is praying, a space sort of opens up between heaven and earth. As Jesus talks to his Father, this space between heaven and earth gets very thin. It's thin enough for the Spirit to descend, thin enough for Moses and Elijah to come and meet Jesus on that mountain. It's thin enough for God's voice to be heard by the disciples. As Jesus talks to his father, his appearance is transformed and he's changed, we're told. The spirit lands on him in bodily form. His face changes, his clothes change as he prays. And we get this sense that it's talking with his father that makes this possible somehow. We don't know what he was praying just that he was. We'll keep going. In Luke 5, Jesus heals a man full of leprosy, a skin disease. And word about Jesus begins to spread throughout the countryside even more um, than it already was. And it says great crowds are gathering to hear him and be healed of their infirmities. 
And then we're told that Jesus, and it's like right after that statement that this great crowd is gathering, we're told that Jesus would withdraw to a desolate place to pray. And then he would do it. It, it. We get the sense that he keeps doing this. In Luke 6, uh, similarly, we see him healing and teaching and calling disciples to follow him. And he's even challenging the boundaries set by the religious elite already in Luke 6. And then we're told that in those days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And that this one time, he prayed all through the night to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and he chose from among them 12 whom he named apostles. And as their title indicates, they would be his messengers, his delegates, the ones he'd send out to tell people about him. So with these two stories, what do we learn about prayer? Jesus made room for it in his life. And he chose to do it in solitude sometimes. He would go off alone to pray, to meet with God on the mountain, just like his ancestor Moses had done. Uh, we're going to look at that story, um, I think, in two weeks. I'm super excited about it. Um, one of my favorites. But anyway, Jesus was, was imitating what Moses had done, uh, going up to the mountain alone to pray. Jesus made time to talk to his father. And part of that time in prayer, um, he would be discerning things, like who to choose as his apostles. Luke also gives us a picture of what Jesus taught his disciples about prayer. So he modeled it for them, but he also taught about, taught about it. And he told them sometimes what to pray for. Um, this was so interesting to me as I like looked at all of these instances. So in chapter 6, he tells his disciples to pray for their enemies. In chapter 10, as he's sending out the 72, uh, he tells them to pray earnestly to the Lord, to send out laborers into his harvest because the harvest is plentiful. In chapter 11, we get his teaching on prayer. That's what we looked at last week. Pray like this, Jesus says. Father, your name be hallowed. Your kingdom come, your will be, or he doesn't say your will be done in Luke. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. And don't lead us into temptation. He gives them this prayer, and it acts as a prayer of orientation. Um, and then he gives two illustrations that reveal God as both friend and father, attentive and responding to the prayers of his children. What do we learn about prayer from these instances? What do we see? Well, <laughs> this was interesting. It appears that what Jesus told his disciples to pray for didn't have much to do with changing their circumstances, with stopping something from happening or making something the running theme of these um, instances where he's telling the disciples what to pray for um, are asking God for help in the midst of the circumstances that we are already facing or that we will face. These instances show Jesus teaching us to come to God with our needs, honestly and boldly. He teaches us to pray for strength, to pray that we won't enter into temptation, to pray for forgiveness when we make mistakes, to pray for those who hurt us, who persecute us, to pray for God to be made known in the world and for his kingdom to come. So we don't get any glimpses of the content of Jesus' prayers until chapter 22. That stuck out to me, too. We don't know what he prayed specifically um, to the Father until we get to chapter 22. And there we get two examples. The first is right before he and his disciples make their way to the Mount of Olives for the last time. And he tells Peter in that moment that Satan has demanded to have him, that he might sift him like wheat, wheat but that he's prayed for Peter that his faith may not fail. 
The second is in the midst of the garden scene just before he's betrayed. And here I'll invite you to read with me if you have your Bibles. Um, this is the first prayer of Jesus that we get in Luke, that we get his actual words. I'm starting in verse 39, if you're following along. And he came out and he went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, isn't that funny, uh, the place, he said to them, pray that you might not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed even more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Here in this moment, um, as Jesus is facing his fate, his destiny, Jesus himself prays that his circumstances He prays that God will somehow take this cup of wrath that he's about to drink, that God will take it away. Uh, that image, the cup of wrath, has um, deep roots in the Old Testament, actually. Um, I'll explain it in a minute. Jesus knows that the suffering that he's going to endure, he knows about the suffering that he's going to endure, and he's asking God for another way. Um, the wrath is God's response to evil. Um, it's not directed at Jesus. Somehow um, in the church, sometimes that has gotten um, twisted um, and told a certain way. Um, God's wrath is always directed at evil. And Jesus' death is a response to evil. So you can see how it kind of interacts. Jesus knows that about this wrath. He knows that it's not his father's wrath coming at him. Um, he knows that his crucifixion and death are going to lead to the salvation of humankind. He knows that this is part of what he was sent to do, but he still asks God to take it away in that moment. One of the commentators I read said, the real struggle is here in this moment. And we see Jesus submitting to God's will at the same time that he's asking for deliverance. In his agony, uh, knowing what is to come, he both prays and surrenders. What do we learn about Jesus, or about prayer through Jesus here? Prayer can be utterly honest and full of desire. But it is also a place of surrender, of opening our hands. Your name be hallowed, your kingdom come, your will be done. We learn that sometimes in that surrender, we don't get what we ask for. Even when there are most desperate prayers. I think about Jesus' relationship with the Father here. His Father. He would have spent so much time in prayer um, throughout his life. Uh, he models that. Um, we even get glimpses of it through Luke and through others um, that write about him. He talked to God. And those moments where God would have met him and he would have experienced that thin space, um, those moments of communion with his father, um, sort of shored up even by what the scriptures would have revealed to him about who God is, um, and so that he knew the one he was talking to, the one who called him beloved so that his own ears could hear it. He trusted God in the midst of this. 
He trusted him enough to give him his most desperate prayer, but to also open his hand. This open-handedness is a work of the Spirit in us, I think. It comes from spending time with God, with that trust being built over time. So uh, I had some like specific prayers last spring. Um, I was struggling in some ways, and um, I was wanting to learn to be a better leader, um, a healthier leader. I didn't want to be leveled so often by um, either criticism or like um, kind of like the circumstances of my job. Um, and, and we all have that, right, in, in the various places that we uh, spend our time. So anyway, I was asking for that, uh, to become a better and healthier leader. Uh, I was asking for joy um, in the ministry and in my life. Um, and I also asked for a mantra, <laughs> something that I would be able to like say over and over to myself, something simple um, that would help ground me. Um, and, and bring me back to my center. Um, at the same time that I started praying this, I started to make sure that I was, not make sure, but like I was stepping into prayer more intentionally, more often. Um, not that I don't pray, I, I pray a lot, but to sit down and actually take time, uh, sometimes life pushes that out of the way for me. Um, and I started to give more time to prayer in solitude. And what do you know? Um, God answered those prayers. God's work in our lives is so subtle. It's so gentle. Um, sometimes to the point where we don't even recognize that it's happening until after it's happened. So like, it was a couple of weeks ago that I was like, oh my goodness, I was praying those things and and you've brought me here to this place where at least I'm on the way. I maybe I won't ever arrive, right? Like to becoming like the, the healthiest leader, like whatever. But like I'm on the way and, and I feel like God has come alongside me in each one of those things in particular ways. Um, he's helped. He's helped me to open my hands, actually. That time with him has actually been probably the most central part of, of this um, being able to move into this healthier space. Because that's where I find uh, that I am grounded, is actually recognizing, wait a minute, you're here and you're with me in this. Um, one of the verses that keeps coming to me is from, I think it's Psalm 91. Um, and it, I sent this to Tara actually like a number of weeks ago. The one who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So that's what I'm trying to practice really intentionally. Um, and I invite you to do that with me. Um, I think it's... Um, Time with him that shapes us, actually, that moves us into more wholeness and healing, um, into maybe some stability, but it's not stability in terms of our circumstances, right? Like, circumstances are the circumstances of life, but it's being able to, to be centered in the midst of that, knowing that he's right here. Let's step back and look at the whole painting now. As we look at what Jesus taught and showed us about prayer in Luke, on how to pray and what to pray for and who we're praying to, what do we see? What do we learn about prayer through Jesus? The one we're praying to is listening attentively. And he's responding as friend and father. Sometimes the space where we meet with God and God, God meets with us is a really thin space. Making room for prayer 
is meant to be part of the rhythm of our lives. Getting away alone to pray is important. Talking to God and spending time with him is important. Prayer is a place where we can discern next steps. In it, in that space of prayer, God guides us and reveals things to us. Prayer is about asking God for help for ourselves and for others. Not necessarily always about changing the circumstances, but asking God to help us in the midst of our circumstances. But you know what? We can be so honest in the midst of our circumstances at the same time. We can tell God what we need. Sometimes our prayer is about asking our circumstances to change, asking for a certain outcome. But those prayers are meant to be rooted in surrender. The world is moving along its own path. Life happens. And what we've seen in Jesus here is that through prayer, God actually moves in us. God changes us. We learn that God is with us in the midst of life to help us. Amen. Let's pray together. Jesus, may we um, leave here with these images with this painting in our minds. May we be drawn to pray by your spirit um, and by our need. May we model it for our children as well. Amen. We're just going to have the kids come back in. So at Stonehouse, we practice communion every week. And uh, as we come to the table, we recognize what Jesus has done for us. And sort of like what I was talking about with baptism and dedication, um, the table names over us that we are the forgiven people of God. And so at Stonehouse, we actually have an open table. We welcome all to share in this feast. Um, so our children come and we kind of file up and I'll hand you a bread, a piece of bread, or you can grab a piece of bread out of the basket or a cracker. I have some rice crackers and then I'll hand you a glass of juice. Um, you can either take it back to your seat if you'd like, or you can stand to the side. Um, excuse me. I just ask that you put your cups on the table either right away after you've drank or, um, after the service. So... Let's come to the table together. The Gospels tell us that on the first day of the week, the day our Lord rose from the dead, he appeared to some of his disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of bread. And it's true for us as well. Christ is made known to us as we break this bread and we drink this cup together. Listen to these words of Jesus. They are your invitation. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If those who hear my voice open the door, I will come in to them and eat with them, and they with me. The Apostle Paul tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the death of Christ until he comes again. I invite you to repeat this after me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again.
Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, blessed forever. To you be praise and honor for giving yourself, shedding your blood, and letting your body be broken in death for our sake, so that we might have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Bless, O oh God, this bread which we together eat, and the cup which we together drink. Let us, through this bread and this cup, become partakers of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Unite us with one another, Lord, and with all your saints in heaven and on earth. Consecrate us, set us apart, body and soul, to be a living acceptable offering to you, so that in word and deed we may continually praise and glorify your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Sisters and brothers, this is food for the journey to which God has called us, so let our lives be nourished by the Lord himself as we come together at this table. I invite you to come to this table of grace. 